darkness, darkness, darkness of the ages round. Covering earth, covering sky, breeding up the things of life, bringing forth the crying things. Man, man, the living thing, the thing of earth, of sky, of sea. The master shape of destiny, man alone, man alone to face the dark. Man alone to face the beast, the crawling thing, the thing of prey. Man alone to face the sea, the fearsome sea of depth and strength. The sea unbounded, wild, immense, deep, unknown. Man alone, alone. Man's lot, the lot of search, the search for shelter and for food. And so it has been since man's time began. Search, search, search the land for fruit and seed. No, plant the seed and end the search. Let the seed bring forth the grain. Let the grain grow grain across the wide, wide land, grain to nurture man in want, grain for bread and grain to store, never hunger anymore. Or so it might have seemed when man first planned a harvest against tomorrow's hunger that the search was over. But as man learned to produce food to meet his needs, he found his search had just begun. Food met only the needs of the body, but man's total needs were greater. He longed for comfort, for better shelter, and for communication with his brothers in distant lands. So the search went on. Men of Spencer, joining in the search, foresaw the needs for stuffs that could be taken from the air, from the rivers, and the huge stores of natural gas. For these things would answer man's ever-growing needs for more food, better shelter, a richer manner of living. Here on the broad prairies, among the grain fields, men of Spencer have built the first of a series of vital links in putting to man's use the unbounded resources of nature. Here were constructed the huge buildings housing the awe-inspiring tools tools that make possible the combining of air and gas and water to produce compounds unknown a generation ago. Tools whose very size and complexity tax man's powers of imagination. Here are the machines which feed on prosaic raw materials to bring forth a multitude of products for industry and agriculture. Inside these giants, tremendous pressures and intricate processes alter the shape and substance of nature's products creating new materials. For here, with these machines, the men of Spencer work toward their goal, the total utilization of natural resources. Mr. Kenneth Spencer, president of the company, has for many years seen the possibilities of an infinite harvest through chemistry. After the harnessing of electric energy, the perfection of new anesthetics, and the development of the radio, in the airplane, many, many people felt that technological progress had reached maturity and made its full contribution to a better world. Today, with our knowledge of atomic energy, with its great opportunities and hazards, with the development of new processes and new products in the field of chemistry, it is realized that we are only on the threshold of a great new technological horizon. We are learning more about the conservation and better utilization of our natural resources. And like the men who have gone before, we are searching for ways and means of doing more with what we have. Ways and means of creating more and better products for a more abundant 
and better life. And now, we invite you to see some of our products and some of our processes. At the big Jayhawk Works in Pittsburgh, Kansas, has been put together the key combination of men and machines to produce the vital Spencer chemicals for industry and agriculture. Ammonia is the first major product of the Spencer Chemical Company. In producing it here at the Jayhawk Works, Spencer manufactures a basic ingredient for many of its other chemical products. And during the manufacture of ammonia, incidental compounds are formed which become a host of valuable byproducts. Ammonia is made up of hydrogen and nitrogen in the ratio of three parts of hydrogen to one of nitrogen. Ammonia is a substance so volatile that if released from the pressure under which it must be stored, it vaporizes instantly. Hydrogen is a gas found in great abundance in a familiar form, natural gas, the same gas that cooks your steak or keeps your hot water tank operating. Nitrogen, the other element needed to make ammonia, is also a gas present in a never-ending source, the air we breathe. We have plenty of available hydrogen in America's reserves of natural gas. We have all the nitrogen we need in the air around us. What then is the problem? Hydrogen must be separated from the carbons of natural gas and set free. The nitrogen must be released from the many gases of which air is composed and set free. And then the problem is only partly solved because the pure hydrogen and the pure nitrogen must be made to combine in the right proportion to form the new compound, ammonia. The difficulties encountered in this process require the development of highly specialized equipment, the skills of chemists, the ingenuity of chemical engineers, the generation of tremendous amounts of power, and with it all, split-second coordination between each and every plant in the Jayhawk works. In the first stage, which takes place in the power plant, water is converted into live steam in the largest steam generating station in the state. From the great boilers, the steam surges through giant turbines, lending a portion of its power to the generation of electricity to run the plant. From the power plant, the live steam travels in insulated pipelines across the distance to the gas reforming plant. As the steam enters the four-story high structures called primary furnaces, it is mixed with natural gas in carefully controlled proportions. The abundant supply of incoming natural gas from the rich mid-continent fields is measured. Here the gas is to give up its hydrogen for man's use, and it is gobbled up in the reforming process at the rate of 25 million cubic feet a day, enough to supply an average city of 125,000 people. In these primary furnaces, the steam and natural gas are subjected to temperatures in excess of 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. These ovens break down the gas and steam into other gases, thus freeing the hydrogen. In the secondary furnaces inside the gas reforming plant, nitrogen, the other element in ammonia, is added. Air is introduced into the partially reformed gas stream and the oxygen is removed, leaving the desired mixture of hydrogen and nitrogen. Thus, in the first major step, the gas reforming step, we have nitrogen and hydrogen released from their original compounds, but mingled with other gases which must be removed. Following purification, this product of the reforming stage is ready for synthesis into ammonia. After the gas mixture has been sufficiently cooled, it flows to this temporary storage tank. Although this tank holds some 200,000 cubic feet of gas, 
it is only enough to keep the works operating approximately four minutes, evidence of the clockwork precision necessary to keep a Spencer chemical plant functioning. From the temporary storage tank, the gas is piped to one of the most important buildings in the Jayhawk works, the ammonia synthesis plant. The mixture of gases, which includes hydrogen and nitrogen, is compressed to the tremendous pressure of 5,000 pounds per square inch. The gas, which enters in two 42-inch pipes, is compressed into a single pipe with an inside diameter of only two and a quarter inches. During the complicated procedures of the compression stage, Gases other than hydrogen and nitrogen, which are not needed for the formation of ammonia, are carefully measured and sent to other parts of the works to make other products. Constant control analysis is required during the actual wetting of the hydrogen to the nitrogen to form ammonia. Testing at this stage in the Jayhawk works is a remarkable continuous process where actual samples of the gases are piped directly from the heart of the process, the compressors, to the laboratory. Amid a myriad of tubes and gauges, chemists keep close watch on this constant 24-hour process of analysis and control. On the rare occasions when impurities are found in the gas, an elaborate alarm system signals the emergency to the operators. Red lights flash, warning bells clang. Emergency switches are pulled. Valves are opened. And the impure gases are released to the winds until the source of the impurity is discovered and corrected. Then the go-ahead sign is given. The warning signals stop. The operators check the many gauges and dials as the gas is once again routed into the ever-hungry machines. In this compressor, hydrogen and nitrogen are combined under high pressure, carefully controlled temperature, and in the presence of a catalyst. Technically, a catalyst changes the speed of a chemical reaction without being changed itself. For example, if you try to burn an ordinary lump of sugar with a match, you will find that little or nothing happens. However, sprinkle a few cigarette ashes on the sugar and then try the match. In this case, the cigarette ash is the catalyst, causing the sugar to burn rapidly, and yet the ash remains the same and could be used over and over again. Catalysts are used in the manufacture of chemicals in the same way to affect the rate of chemical change. These Horton spheres lend their symmetrical beauty to the Jayhawk works, but more important, they provide the equalized pressure necessary in storing the ammonia that is pumped into them from the ammonia synthesis plant. From the Horton spheres, a large part of the ammonia is piped to the nitric acid plant. In the nitric furnaces, ammonia and air are mixed under high pressure to form oxides of nitrogen. By animated drawings, we can show a highly simplified version of what actually happens. It is in these furnaces that the air and ammonia gas are first mixed together and then pass across a catalytic screen, causing the mixture to burn and form oxides of nitrogen. This catalytic screen performs an important function in the production of nitric acid. The screens are made of the precious metal platinum and cost thousands of dollars. Periodically, each screen must be replaced and reclaimed. The result of the mixture of air and ammonia burning over the platinum catalyst is a brownish-orange gas called oxides of nitrogen. The gas is forced to bubble up through distilled water and in so doing, most of the oxides of nitrogen are dissolved in the water, and the resulting liquid substance is known as nitric acid, one of the important liquids of the chemical industry. For nitric acid, like its parent product, ammonia, is a key chemical to a whole family of nitrogen-rich compounds.
In layer upon layer of absorption tanks, the process of dissolving oxides of nitrogen to form nitric acid is carried out. The end product is extremely corrosive. To illustrate, when an iron nail is dropped into nitric acid, the chemical reaction is immediate and violent while the stainless steel rod in the flask on the left shows no visible reaction. Due to this corrosive action of nitric acid on iron, all of the equipment in this big nitric acid plant is made of stainless steel. Leaving this plant, the nitric acid is piped to the ammonium nitrate plant, where it is mixed with sufficient ammonia to make a neutral solution. The heat generated by the action evaporates the water formed in the neutralization. In this clear, colorless liquid, ammonium nitrate, we see for the first time the results of the intricate closed-in processes which have taken place in other parts of the plant. In this test, the temperature is lowered to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point the solution begins to cloud and will eventually freeze. Because of this, liquid ammonium nitrate must be kept hot even during storage. These great tanks are steam heated as the ammonium nitrate solution constantly circulates within them, awaiting further processing at the Jayhawk works. Much of the ammonium nitrate solution is piped directly to the prilling plant. These imposing shafts reminiscent of the grain elevators which rise across the plains, are really jumping off places for the ammonium nitrate solution. The liquid ammonium nitrate is pumped to the top of the towers, where it is forced out in a fine spray through a rush of upward moving air. The spray gathers into droplets like hail or sleet and solidifies as it falls to form tiny pearl-like grains called prills. Now, at last, one of the products of the Jayhawk works is out in the open, ammonium nitrate prills. The prills move endlessly past on conveyor belts, which carry them through a series of rotating dryers. The conveyor belt ducks into a shaft, and the properly dehydrated prills are on their way to the bagging and shipping plant. But first, diatomaceous earth, a special dressing which prevents the prills from caking, is mixed with the tiny pearl-like product by an ingenious scale system which weighs both components so that the composition never varies. As the conveyor belts come to the end of the cycle, the ammonium nitrate funnels down to be bagged and weighed, stitched and sealed shut. and finally to be loaded into boxcars. Here in these rows of sacks is the ally man sought in his search for an infinite harvest. Ammonium nitrate fertilizer, ready to go out to the farms of the nation, ready to do its job of producing more food for America and for the world. But Spencer has not been content with this single contribution. Spencer chemicals for industrial use surpass even ammonium nitrate fertilizer in importance. Spensol, a high nitrogen ammoniating solution, is shipped in low pressure tank cars directly to fertilizer mixing plants in all parts of the United States. Spensol is produced in this plant at the Jayhawk Works. Spensol is a solution of solid ammonium nitrate and ammonia in water made in several grades tailored to the requirements of industrial users. In the dry ice plant, carbon dioxide, one of the co-products removed from the gas mixture during the production of ammonia, is processed. By compression, carbon dioxide is liquefied and then stored in the familiar shipping tanks, which release the sizzle into your fountain drink. With further processing in these automatic machines, the invisible gas solidifies into super cold snow, which is pressed into cakes to become dry ice or freeze-all. Freeze-all is indispensable as a refrigerant for meats and meat products. It is essential in the ice cream industry, and it serves as an agent for metal shrinking in industrial use. The ammonia produced by the Jayhawk works may be compressed and cooled to a liquid, 
refrigeration grade ammonia, which is sold in tank cars, or cylinders as a refrigerant in the ice and food industries. Aqua ammonia, like the bottle of household cleaner stored under your sink, is also produced for industrial use in the petroleum industry and in the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. for use in your city's water purification system. Commercial grade anhydrous ammonia is shipped to manufacturers of chemicals and fertilizers, sent to paper mills for the production of wood pulp, to rayon mills and to petroleum refineries, to explosive manufacturing plants, to synthetic resin producers, shipped to all the worldwide users of nitrogen-rich ammonia. Spencer maintains whole fleets of high and low pressure tank cars individually engineered for the products they will transport. Trucks and vans carry many Spencer products directly to the consumer. From these impressive towers employed in the distillation of methanol gases at the Jayhawk Works, comes methanol, or synthetic wood alcohol. Some methanol goes into the production of high-grade antifreeze for your automobile. Some of the methanol processed in these compressors is sold to paint and varnish manufacturers. It has many uses as a general solvent and is widely used by producers of organic chemicals and dye stuffs. Methanol is shipped in tank car lots from the Jayhawk Works to another of Spencer's great plants, the Chicago Works. At the Chicago plant, methanol is further processed into formaldehyde. In a process similar to the manufacture of nitric acid, a mixture of methanol vapor and air is passed over a catalyst to form formaldehyde, a new combination of air and gas and water. A constant stream of formaldehyde flows from these intricate machines. Formaldehyde for the production of plastics, dyes for textiles, and tanning aids for leather. And all of these are but a few of the ultimate uses to which Spencer produced formaldehyde may be put. The Henderson, Kentucky Works produces anhydrous ammonia. Convenience in shipping makes Henderson a direct sales source for eastern and southern markets. Much of the anhydrous ammonia produced here at Henderson is sent to other plants for further processing. In the giant new Vicksburg, Mississippi works, the method of preparing ammonia differs from the process at the Jayhawk plant but the raw materials are the same, air, gas, and water. Raw materials are wrenched apart by crushing pressures, forced into new forms by contact with silver, copper, and platinum catalysts, made to roil through tortuous mazes of tubes and pipes, watched over by countless gauges and valves and control boards. This plant, symbolic of the industrial awakening of the New South, pours forth the basic chemicals for use in the manufacture of an endless number of valuable products. And in the research laboratories, men whose inventiveness keeps Spencer foremost in its field work to improve the products of far-flung plants. Here are men seeking, searching, testing, trying, devising new ways to use Spencer products for mankind's comfort, convenience, and well-being. And so in these United States and in many countries throughout the world, Spencer is making its contribution to better living, to greater comfort, to increased prosperity. Men of Spencer, men who have designed and built this tremendous empire, constantly searching for new ways, better ways toward new and better things. Machines geared to the rapid advances of the laboratory, 
geared to the needs of industry and agriculture. All combining to wrest from the air and American earth those vital ingredients to make resins and plastics for telephones, clocks, household goods and toys. Solvents for rayon, for varnishes, for tire manufacture, pharmaceuticals to guard America's health, dye stuffs to make Miss and Mrs. America's clothing beautiful to see. From the time you open your morning newspaper, printed on paper produced with the aid of Spencer Chemicals, until you retire in a garment dyed with synthetic dyes, when you relax with your camera, your gun, a bottle of soda pop, when you fill your radiator with antifreeze, when you eat a steak grown tender and tempting on nitrogen-enriched pastures, in an unbelievable number of things you do every day, you are sharing in an infinite harvest. A harvest that begins here, but does not end, nor is an end in sight. For here in Spencer lies the power to make the dream a reality. An infinite harvest from the natural resources of the earth.